now. And then we're going live. Have a great event. Thanks. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's live online author event with Greenlight Bookstore. I'm Katie from Greenlight, and we're thrilled to host tonight's event with Julie Tarek Dalton presenting her new book, Waiting for the Night Song. She will be talking with Paula Sicky, so you're in for an excellent time. Before we start, I just want to say a huge thanks to Julie, Paul, and the team at Forge Books for making this happen, and to all of you for showing up. Though we're not able to host events in our store spaces, our community of authors and readers is still here. We're grateful for your support and for the chance to make space for conversation and connection. Before we get started, there's just a few housekeeping things to go over. In our Zoom webinar tonight, you can see and hear the speakers, but they can't see or hear you. They can see that you're here though, and you can see a count of fellow attendees at the top of your Zoom screen, but the exact location will depend on what kind of device you're using. There are a couple different ways you can interact with the authors and with each other throughout tonight's event, which we highly encourage. The first is the chat, which you can find by clicking on the icon that looks like one speech balloon. You're welcome to post your comments and thoughts in the chat. It's a great way to show your appreciation for the author and to interact with your fellow attendees. So if you have a specific question you'd like to have answered by the author, please post that question in the Q&A module, which you can find by clicking on the icon that looks like two speech balloons. Uh, we'll be pulling questions only from the Q&A to be answered in the later part of the program. So please make sure you're putting your questions there and not in the chat. We are recording tonight's event, so look for video or audio versions on our social media channels later on. And importantly, tonight's featured book, Waiting for the Night Song, is available for sale from Greenlight Bookstore. You can shop in person in our bookstore locations, 12 p.m. to 7 p.m. every day of the week, and you can purchase Julie's book and many others on site. Or order online at greenlightbookstore.com for a quick pickup at the store or for shipping anywhere in the U.S. I'll drop the buy link in the chat in just a moment. If you care about supporting the careers of authors and the ongoing existence of independent bookstores, buying tonight's featured book is a great way to show your support. Our interviewer for tonight is Paula Sicky. He is the author of six books, including The Narrow Door, Unbuilt Projects, Lawn Boy, and most recently, Later. His awards include fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown. He teaches in the MFA program at Rutgers University, and he lives in Brooklyn. He will be speaking with our featured author, Julie Carrick Dalton. Her debut novel, Waiting for the Night Song, has been named the most anticipated 2021 book list by numerous platforms, including CNN, Newsweek, USA Today, Parade, and BuzzFeed. As a journalist, Julie has published more than 1,000 articles and publications including the Boston Globe, Business Week, The Hollywood Reporter, and the Chicago Review of Books. A Tin House alum, 2021 Breadloaf Environmental Writers Conference Fellow, and graduate of Grub Street's Novel Incubator, Julie is a member of the Climate Fiction Writers League and is a frequent speaker at, uh, and workshop leader on the topic of fiction in the age of climate crisis. Mom to four kids and two dogs, Julie also owns a small farm in rural New Hampshire. Her new book, Waiting for the Night Song, is a love song to the natural beauty around us, a call to fight for what we believe in and a reminder that the truth will always rise. This moving and timely debut has received praise from many fellow writers, including Omar el Akkad, Kim Michelle Richardson, Peter Gieve, and Michelle Hoover, who says, both a timely and timeless literary mystery, Waiting for the Night Song is as seductive as it is smart, blending the allure of Julie Dalton's beloved rural New Hampshire setting with the dark undercurrents of a community's racial divisions and betrayals. This is a story of love, of home, of friendship and family, of a childhood's innocence and an adult's comeuppance, all of which are in the line of fire in this beauty of a page turner. Julie is going to start us off with a reading from the book, and then she will be talking with Paul and with all of you. Please take it away, Julie. Hi, well, thank you, Katie. Thanks for inviting me here, and thanks to you, Paul, for being here. I am really grateful to Greenlight for sponsoring this evening tonight and all the independent bookstores out there, because especially during the pandemic, authors and debut authors like me especially, um, we wouldn't have a chance to get our stories out there and to share them with you. So we are so grateful to the independent bookstores who have really kept us all going during the pandemic. So I encourage you to buy from your local bookstores, buy from Greenlight or the bookstore down the street, um, whether it's my book or not, feel free to buy my book. But if it's not my book, buy another one from the local bookseller. So I'm gonna to start tonight with a, a reading from chapter two. I'm not starting at the beginning. My book is a dual timeline narrative, which goes back and forth from the um, perspective of uh, Katie Kessler. She's 11 years old in one timeline and she is 37 in another timeline. 
So I'm going to start you chapter two, and this is the first time that you're going to meet Katie Kessler. Um, she's 11 years old in this scene, and this scene um, is one of my favorites in the book. I had the most fun writing it, and um, it, it's the moment that set everything else in the story into motion. It's the moment that Katie's going to look back on for the rest of her life and wonder, you know, what if I'd done something different? So this is chapter two. Warped floorboards in the kitchen played like a piano under Katie's feet. If she maintained her rhythm and balance from the long board in front of the sink to the short plank behind her father's chair, to that narrow strip in the middle of the room, she could coax the melody of twinkle, twinkle little star out of the moaning, creaking wood. Standing at the threshold between the kitchen and the hallway, Katie mapped her route across the kitchen, seeking out the stiff mute boards that promised a silent passage to the door on the other side of the room. Thin light filtered through the muslin curtains at a familiar angle, 6.30 a.m. Katie often stole mornings while her parents slept to practice in case she ever needed to escape from something. What she would need to escape from, she did not know yet. Notice your surroundings, know your escape route, like Sherlock Holmes. With six leaps, she landed in the front of the screen door and eased it open just enough to squeeze her torso through. If she opened it one inch too far, the squeak would alert her parents. Outside, a frothy mist hung over the lake. She tiptoed out to the end of the rickety pier and sat, letting her feet dip into the tepid water. At first, Katie didn't notice the boat, half obscured by the water. But as it crept closer, the small vessel broke through the gauzy curtain, a yellow rowboat, drifting alone with no captain, no passengers. She stood up to see inside, maybe someone lay at the bottom, a lost child, maybe a murderer ready to jump out and grab her. Pressing up on her toes, she stretched as far as she dared out over the water. She still couldn't see inside. The boat floated closer, closer and then it passed by her pier on a barely noticeable current without pause. The morning sun infused the mist with a creamy molten glow. Pressure swelled inside Katie's rib cage. A longing rippled through her muscles and clung to her bones, pulling her toward that boat as if the universe needed her to act. If she hesitated, if she went inside to ask permission, it would be gone. Disappeared into the clouds like a dream she would never remember. She peeled off her pajama top and shorts, looked back at the house. Her toes curled around the edge of the warped gray boards, clinging to the rules she always obeyed. She filled her chest with a misty air, pinched her nose and jumped. So I'm gonna stop there and I'm not gonna tell you what's in that boat, um, but what, what she finds with this boat is gonna change the course of her life for the for good and for bad. And all the things that happen afterwards, she will always look back to that moment. What if I hadn't jumped in the water? Thank you, Julie. I'm so excited to talk to you about your beautiful book and so excited to see you almost in person after <laughs> two years. It's been two years since yeah. we um, worked together at Tin House. And I'm so I'm so thrilled to see this book come into the world and get such attention and acclaim. And um, I thought I'd start with um, this question. When did you first start, start to write the book? Was there an inciting image or did you encounter a story? Um, yeah. Yeah, so um, there is a very specific image that started this whole story and it's the um, image of of little girls in a boat picking blueberries from off the shore from the boat. And um, this came about, I have four kids of my own and we spent a lot of time on a lake in New Hampshire, which is the backdrop for this story. And I used to take my kids blueberry picking a lot. We would go out and we'd pick blueberries from the canoe and bring them home and make waff blueberry waffles and pancakes. And when we would pick them, my kids started asking me, you know, who are we stealing them? Because they were, these were wide open pieces of land. Um, some of it was public land and there weren't any houses around. So I never thought anybody would care, but I found myself making up these silly rules for my kids about why it was okay to pick the blueberries. And which I soon realized was not a great parenting role modeling. <laughs> so, but the idea stuck in my head about how we make up rules to justify things. And so I stopped doing that with my own kids, but this idea stuck in my head. So I had these little girls in the story make up a set of rules for why it was okay to do something. And then the story just kind of moved out from that one image. 
Did the book change a lot over the course of its writing? How long did you, um, how many years did you spend <laughs> on the book? Not long at all, just 13 years. <laughs> just, just, just 13 years. A breeze. Yeah. yeah. No, so yeah, it took me 13 years. I would say the last four years I worked on it pretty seriously. Um, you know, I was raising four young kids in the beginning. So I was stealing moments in the carpool pickup lines and waiting at soccer practice and writing little bits here and there. But the last several years I got serious about it. And the book did change a lot. Um, as I mentioned, it's a dual timeline that goes back and forth in time between Katie at 11 and Katie at, at um, 39. But um, initially I wrote the whole thing straight through from her childhood. I wrote her middle school, high school, college, her twenties, all the information you never needed to know about Katie. <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of, at some point realized that all that stuff in the middle was irrelevant. Like I needed to know what happened to Katie those years. And it helped me understand her as a character and how, who she became as an adult. But it was really very boring. <laughs> and so I cut out the whole middle and then I was in, left with a mystery in her childhood and then a mystery in her adulthood that were very connected to each other. So mm -hmm. in telling the story, I realized if I tangled them up and told them simultaneously, these two mysteries really fed off of each other and created a bigger story. So that okay. but it took a long time for me to figure that out. It wasn't intuitive. I didn't, I didn't come to that structure right away. Right, right. It, it feels like an earned structure. <laughs> Um, Katie said um, a few minutes ago that you were the owner and operator of an organic farm in New Hampshire. And you, and as you brought that farm to life, you brought this book to life. And I wondered if you could say a little about the interrelationship of doing that work and growing a book. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. I did grow a book and I grew a farm. The, um, yeah, so my farm we built from scratch. It was a piece of land that had been on the um, near our family home and it was on the market to be timbered and developed. And so um, we took this kind of ridiculous leap of faith and bought this piece of property and the, the area that had already been cleared for timber, we built a farm on it. Um, and what motivated me to do that was the property is really close to our home. We have tons of animals and it's a hundred acre tract of woods and it's beautiful and has a little babbling brook in it that looks like it came out of a fairy tale. And all these animals, these bear and deer and moose would come to, they would walk into our yard sometimes. Um, they lived there. And so I didn't like that they were timbering it. So we built this farm and I had absolutely no business building a farm because I didn't know anything about anything to do with agriculture. So I, when we were doing this, I was studying agriculture and soil science and forestry, trying to understand how to take care of this piece of land I had bought. Um, and so I was writing the book at the same time mothering four young kids at the same time. And so it's all very much one story to me. I would read something, uh, and a good example is um, when I was working on my farm, when I was reading about different you know, agricultural practices in the area, I came across this tidbit that, like, that the uh, growing season in my region has been extended by 22 days. That's a fact that actually comes up and I, I worked it into the story because I thought it was shocking that over the last century, it, we have three weeks more of a growing season. Mm -hmm. And then it made me wonder about all the other things that would be affected by this slow rise in temperature in New Hampshire, which is real. And so as I was working on the farm, I was studying agriculture. And as I was working on the book, I was researching things that I actually used in on my farm. So they kind of fed each other, the two projects, or, you know, both helped raise each other, I guess. So did you say you grew up in New Hampshire? No, I did not. I actually grew up in Maryland. Our farm oh, is in New Hampshire. We have a, a, a family place in New Hampshire, which is okay. what I'm referring to. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That, so I divide my time between Boston and New Hampshire. And I have a, um, a, someone who leases part of my property to run a horseback riding business when I'm not there. So we have an income year round on the property, but I only mm -hmm. grow food there, obviously, in the summer. One of the things I love about this book and all your work is the wonderful specificity of landscape. Think about the lake and the forest. The forest is always present in your book, even if the scene has moved away from trees. And I ended up, I copied one sentence down that I wanted to read. The precise perfume of the crushed leaves and pine needles in maple crest is sweeter mushroomier aroma than that in the forest where she works, stirred in Katie a fierce desire to protect the home she had so long 
the home she had long ago forsaken. Um, it occurred to me that the, that specificity, that descriptive specificity in your book never reads as research. Mm -hmm. And you know, to my mind, it, it reads like an ongoing act of love and um, kind of an act of love that's out to shake your reader awake as if when thinking about the climate crisis, it isn't enough to simply present facts anymore or cough up ideological information, but it has to appeal to the reader's senses. Does that seem true to you? No, I, I do. I, and I'm glad that you felt that way reading it. Thank you. Um, yeah, I feel like fiction has a capacity to pull people into a story where they might not be pulled into maybe a documentary or a newsreel about climate change. But I think that reading something and identifying with a person or you know a relationship or a, a, even a town in the, as in this story that you can see yourself as part of the story um you know i always think that you know reading fiction is ultimately an enormous act of empathy because you're giving mm -hmm. over your viewpoint to someone else's you're allowing this, the world to be viewed through somebody else's eyes and if you view the world through the eyes of a person who smells, tastes, and hears nature all around them, for the that brief amount of time that you're giving to this book, you're experiencing those things to some degree. And maybe it'll, you know, maybe that moves you in a way to see the world a little different next time you're in a forest. Um, yeah. But I do think that fiction has a unique capacity to engage people in seeing the world the way someone maybe wildly different than them sees it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do you go about summoning up those textures, you know, the smell of those maple leaves, um, yeah, the scent of the air? I mean, how do you, how do you keep that fresh in the work? Hmm. I, I think I just see the world that way a lot. I think it comes naturally to me to see the world through textures and scent in nature because it I notice them, you know, just like, you know, walking or, you know, being outside, I notice those things. So that's what I want to write about it. And there are people who, who see the world very differently than me. And so that, you know, their writing would have, you know, a, you know, a different feel to it because they're noticing different parts of the world than I notice. You could tell the same story from two viewpoints mm -hmm. and it'd be completely different. But I think for me, I'm, you know, when I'm, when I was writing this book and I was outside a lot in the summers, um, when I was working on the farm, I'd be outside all day, like, you know, digging in the dirt or moving rocks or, you know, planting things. And I could, would uh, write in my head a lot while I was outside, just kind of pre-writing, you know, gener generating ideas that I would write down when I got home. So I, in a way I was writing outside, even though it was, you know, in the evening when I came home and put it down on paper, but a lot of the imagery came to me while I literally had my hands in the dirt. Did you speak those sentences over and over or did you thumb them into your phone or? Sometimes I, I, I would, I dictated things into my phone sometimes mm -hmm. because I was like too dirty <laughs> to, to, yeah, yeah. Know, to be typing right. them. But sometimes I would, um, you know, and I also listened to a lot of books on audio while I, when I work in, mm -hmm. on the farm. So I, and I, I don't do it with earbuds and I, keep it on speakerphone. So I think my, my um, vegetables are incredibly well read. <laughs> uh, but so I was either reading or writing a mm -hmm. lot of the time while I was out in, in the um, working in the field. And I, um, I don't know, I think it makes my mind freer when I'm doing something with my hands, you know, to, I don't know, to be creative, if that makes any sense. Yeah, definitely. I know that when I'm, you know, even trying to write an email, trying to write a paragraph, if I'm stuck, it, you know, things change if I walk down the sidewalk and my body is in motion. I think that's just true of how our bodies move through yeah. time and space. It's like we, we need the stimulation of, of, of the body moving forward or digging or making something that's physical. Um, I agree. Yeah. Um, the book is so many things at once. The story of climate crisis, as we said, it's a story of a friendship between a brown girl and a white girl. It's a crime story. It's a love story. It's a story <laughs> of xenophobia and racism. 
the problems of, of the immigration system. I was thinking as I read the book that a lesser writer would just work with two of those strands. <laughs> I love the fact that you um, used the word simultaneity before, because I think one of the real beauties of this book is how it makes use of simultaneity. It, it takes a little bit from that genre and that genre and ends up making this beautiful musical energy out of multiple strands. So the book ends up feeling like a chord again and again that builds and builds and builds. To oh, this that's point. a lovely image, thank you. When I, it's funny because when I think about it, like if I had a visual image of my book, I sort of think about it as like a web. And part of the way I was thinking about the book when I structured it um, was about climate change was kind of like at the a core of, of my thinking and a lot of like I said that, you know, if I had to have a, you know, we term, use the term inciting incident in fiction, the inciting incident for me, not for my book that set me right on the path with this, I think had a lot to do with that number of 22 days extended in the growing season. And I kept thinking about how that would like spread out through the community. And you know, you mentioned there's so many themes, and part of it is because I think that climate change touches everything. It's you can't tell a climate story without thinking about all the different communities it affects, mm -hmm. and that even within the same community, community it affects different people differently, and how that the um, the connections are often things we don't see. So I think there are a lot of. I laughed when you said a, a lesser writer would wouldn't have you know tried this, and I'm laughing thinking maybe a smarter writer wouldn't have tried all these things. <laughs> no, 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 no. But I um I wanted those themes there. I didn't. I think especially when you think about climate, um, you can't tell a climate change story in a silo because if everything is so connected to other things, like you can't mm -hmm. tell. Like I don't know if you remember. Um, that movie, um, the day after tomorrow, when New York froze, and it was just a disaster Big movie. It was, yeah. it was, a, I don't know, in the nineties. Yeah, yeah, it was the first climate fiction I ever right. remember being aware of. But it was, it was this isolated incident, this thing that happened, and you know, these people it happened to. And I don't think you can talk about climate like that. Mm -hmm. I think that you know, climate fiction is a, this kind of growing genre that's becoming more popular because these connections are touching, you know, people in so many different ways. Like in my book, like in the, um, the title of the book, uh, The Night Song refers to a bird, which is a very mm -hmm. real bird in New Hampshire. And it's, um, it's endangered because it migrates to the Caribbean every year. And every year its habitat's being destroyed by deforestation and hurricanes. And so it's not coming back to New Hampshire. And so my character, Katie, is waiting for the night song because she misses this bird that used to be sing to her at night when she was a child. And that's not a connection that seems obvious. Like why would a bird be endangered in New Hampshire because of deforestation in the Caribbean? And so I think these, all these themes that you, you know, with racism, a climate change, friendship, they're all connected to each other. And we're all, we are, we are all connected to each other. Yeah. I was going to ask you, um, the next question on my list was about interconnectedness, and I'm so glad you talked to that. Yeah, I was thinking, so haunted by the story of hurricanes in the Caribbean, preventing that Bicknell's thrush yeah. from, from going to New Hampshire, and then if they're not there, an invasive beetle comes in and starts feasting on the maple trees. And because of that, the, the maple trees are prone to fire and then there is a huge fire. So I, I think if that interconnectedness seems not only central to you know, the vision of this book, but it feels like central to your own vision as a writer. Um, and yeah, I think that speaks so beautifully to how you've woven all these multiple strands into the material to give Thank you. such vibrancy and meaning. There's, a, there's one section in the, um, the past timeline when the little girls are making up their rules. And this was a, a sort of a guiding principle for me when I was writing it, when they're arguing over killing a spider. And one mm -hmm. of them is afraid of the spider, so let's kill it. And the other is like, no, 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 no. You don't know what would happen if you killed that spider, could set off all these 
you know, and she comes up with all these ridiculous chain of events that could possibly happen from killing the spider. And that, that was to me, I went back and added that to the story. It wasn't in there the first draft, but because I felt like it was almost like a parable within the book that represented mm -hmm. this idea of how all of our actions have consequences and we may never know what they are. So when we act, we need, we should understand that even the smallest things we do will have a consequence on someone somewhere. It might be on some other shore, it might be 20 years from now, but somehow it's gonna wash up somewhere. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking about this as a book of causality, you know, the smallest act, as you say, matters, you know, the smallest act doesn't, you know, disperse and fly off into the ether. So yeah. Yeah, how does one live if, you know, one goes around, um, you know, killing spiders. <laughs> right. And then there's the big things too. Like I, I won't give away any spoilers, but there's a traumatic incident that the girls witness as a child and choose to cover it up for reasons that make sense to 11 year olds. As adults yeah. might not have been a great decision, but they had to live with that decision. And it's, it is a big decision, but it also is something that has these ripple effects through their lives, through their friendship, their families, and their whole community from this act that they participated in when they were children. Did you want to say more about that poacher's code? I was thinking about this book as also a meditation on rules that yeah. you know, some rules can be benign, but um, yeah, yeah, yes. Rules so I, can turn and become corrupt, right? Yeah. So I, that I, I um, so for those people who haven't read the book, um, the girls when they come up with all these little rules for what's when it's okay to take blueberries, they call it the poacher's code because they like to say they're poaching blueberries, not stealing them. So they make up these rules and they're very benign rules. They're all silly, like don't pick berries from a bush that has a bird's nest in it. Don't take all the berries from any one bush. If we're stay in the canoe, we're not trespassing. So none of the rules are bad. But when collectively they form this little code of conduct that they swear a blood oath, you know, those like blood sister, blood brother oaths where you, you know, cut your thumb. So they swear an oath to this code. And then when this incident, this traumatic incident happens that they witness, um, re reporting it or revealing what happened would have broken part of their code. And so they sh shield themselves from responsibility partially by saying, we, you know, we can't, we shouldn't do this because we swore an oath. We can't break the poacher's code. And to me, I think that that's a pretty relevant thing that, you know, this is a silly code these little girls wrote, but all codes of ethics or rules or like, I don't know, sorority bylaws or a, I don't know, country club or whatever organization or religion or police regulations, they're meant for good. You know, people design these rules to better their community, but they can be twisted and you can shield yourself and say, oh, I was only doing what I was told or, you know, I'm not allowed to do that because the rules say, say this. We see this, you know, with, you know, police brutality situations, you know, a lot th this year in particular, sure. that people shield themselves by saying, this is what I was supposed to do. I was following orders instead of taking personal responsibility. And in this book, in my book, these little girls, they, they, they don't take personal responsibility and they rely on this manufactured list of codes. And I think that we all have a tendency to do that, to try to protect ourselves. Mm -hmm. Wondering which books um, influenced and fed this book. I mean, do you think of it as talking back to other novels? That's a great question. I will tell you the writers who have an influence on me. I don't know that this book specifically has a book that I was had in mind, but um, Barbara Kingsolver novels have always spoke to me a lot in part because um, she also is a farmer and she built a farm and worked to her land and wrote a book called Animal Vegetable Miracle, which is about her family living off the land. Um, and she's also a novelist, um, which I you know admire her fiction. But I admire her sensibilities about the world. Like the opening to the um, Poisonwood Bible is, it, it's very nature. The whole book is in the nature. It's she's touching things. There's bugs crawling on their skin. It's a, um, so I've always been very drawn to her books. I wouldn't say there's anything about this story that was, uh, but I, I would say she's probably the writer that maybe had the most influence on me um, because of her use of nature perhaps. Mm -hmm. And then I'd say retroactively, I've had a lot of people say that it reminds them of where the crawdads sing, although I didn't read that book till afterwards, but um, I've had a lot of people make references to that book. Well, um, were you always drawn to um, 
animals and trees as a child. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, do you think that, I mean, did New Hampshire teach you to love? No, um, I was always wild. wild. Or did you, did you, <laughs> were you drawn to animals, say, as a young girl in Maryland? Well, I, I grew up, you know, we, you know, growing up in the seventies and eighties, we just, you know, left at breakfast and came back for dinner and just ran, you know, ran all over the neighborhood. And we had, you know, a crick in the backyard and we splashed around and climbed trees and made forts. And the, um, the relationship between Katie and her best friend, Daniela, when they're little is very much based on the relationship between me and my best friend growing up when we were kids. And now we'd never did anything, you know, murdery or crime any in the woods, and at least nothing that I will admit to on camera. But <laughs> but we had this relationship that was the dynamics of the relationship are very similar. And that's what I was I was imagining. We used to make up adventures because we didn't have any real ones. We would invent stories and we would write fan fiction to TV shows and act them out. And it was ridiculous. But we were always climbing trees and building forts and concocting adventures and this story this story grew out of how she and I might have responded if this situation had been us. Mm -hmm. it, it, I was just about to ask you if there had been any real life counterparts. I mean, I mean if any real people had influenced yeah. the characters in the book. And I was thinking about the acknowledgments page in <laughs> which um which you talk about the summer kid on the dock. Yeah. Um, I should have written out the whole quote. It's so beautifully said. I can, so I can read it. I, actually, no, I can read it to you. So, so for people who haven't read it, the summer kid is a, a boy who sits on a pier and the girls, when they're in the, in the book, they paddle by his pier every day. He's just sitting there and they think he's just some vacation kid. And then, but he acts really strange and he keeps shooing them away like he's afraid when they come by. So they start inventing stories in their head about like what could be going on with this kid. And then they start engaging with him and he becomes very much essential to the, what happens in the story. But that part of the story grew up because um, I'll read you what this, at the end of my acknowledgements I wrote. And lastly, to the real life summer kid, the boy who sat alone on the end of his pier reading, fishing and daydreaming. I have no idea who you are or what your name is, but as I paddled by your pier summer after summer, you inspired a story in my mind that took on a life of its own. I hope your world is rich and full of advent and full of the adventure that I imagined you to be dreaming of. So he's real. He grew up um, every summer on that lake. And I, um, he's, I would guess he's in his 20s now, because when I started writing this book 13 years ago, he was a kid sitting out there. And um, this book obviously just came out and uh, a couple weeks ago. So I just now have them in my hands. And this summer, when I go back, I will, I intend to take a copy of my book and put it in a plastic bag with a note and leave it on the end of the pier and thank oh. him for his inspiration. Probably yeah. going to freak him out, but I'm going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> it will freak him out and he'll love it at the same time. <laughs> I um, hope so. I have my eye on the time and I just want to invite people to um, type in some questions in the Q&A. Um, at around 8.15 Eastern, we'll start um, addressing some of your questions. So, so please feel free to ask Julie anything about the book or about writing or anything that you want to know about. Um, you, th this is, this is, Back to the um, back to the making of the book, and I noticed in your in your bio that you were like you've been involved. I think I knew this anyway. You've been involved with Grub Street in Boston yes. for a long time, and you talked or you mentioned in that bio something about the um, the novel incubator program and working with a mentor. And I wonder if you could say a little about um, how, how that experience changed and deepened the book. Yeah, it, it had a huge impact on my book. So the novel incubator is a program out of Grub Street, which is a writing program in Boston. And the um, they every year they have, they invite novelists to submit manuscripts. You have to have a full complete manuscript and they pick 10 people every year and it's a, it's a year, it's very intense. There's 10 of us and we each read each other's manuscripts three times during the year. So that's 30 manuscripts in, wow. in a year. So it's 30 full length books that we all read of each other's 
books because we read each one three times and we do full um, edit letters on the, each other's books and help each other revise our books over the course of one year. It's very, very intense because in addition to reading, it's, you know, there's, we have break, you know, breaks in the summer and at holidays. So it's, it's almost a book a week to, when we're, you know, when we're in session. But we're also writing our own novels and revise, revising our own novels. And the, um, Michelle Hoover, the instructor, gives us homework and outside reading. And so it's a very, it's, it, I think it has a feel of being in an MFA program um, in terms of the level of work. Um, and in the course of it, I think that I learned that I learn more or as much anyway, from editing other people's books as I do having them edit mine. And when I see, I see, mis not, I don't say mistakes, but or you know, problems in someone else's manuscript. And then I look, look at it and I think I do that in my book too, but mm -hmm. I didn't see it in my own writing. But I, I'm, you know, when I open myself up to, you know, working with someone else, I'm, it, it, it helps me see my own writing better. And I think I'm a much better writer. And it, uh, I'll give you a good example of how that played out is, as I said, it took 13 years to write this book. And then when we were well, trying to sell it, my agent had it out, you know, shopping it around to publishers. And I was a nervous wreck. I, you know, I was you know, checking my email too much to see if it, it, I'd heard from her. So to distract myself, I was like, I'll write another book. <sighs> and I wrote the first draft of my upcoming book in 60 days. Now it was, oh, a wow. it, was, it was a trashy draft. It was a mess. It had a lot of problems and I've worked through several drafts of it since. But because I had learned so many things about the structure of a novel, about you know character arcs and, and my own writing quirks, I learned a lot about my own writing quirks that when I started the second book, I knew what I was doing. And I, I'm not saying it was a great first draft, but it was a first draft. And as you know, the first draft is the hardest one to get out. So that book also is a big milestone for me because that book is due today. That, Did um, you turn it in yet? Or? Nope. Oh. <laughs> as soon as we get off, I'm running back into- I don't know how you'd be able to have a conversation without- No, without I turned that part of my brain off. that send button, you're very brave. Yes, yeah, so I sent my I editor a note. I was like, so I'm gonna be live <laughs> on an event for a couple hours, but I promise it's coming. I'm just neatening up a few loose ends, but that book, it's called The Last Beekeeper and it's gonna be out in a year for my same publisher at Forge. And, and Paul was actually my mentor working on that, that draft. Um, I think you saw maybe a third draft of it, not the maybe mm -hmm. the second draft, I don't remember, but it's much improved, I hope, since you saw it. But you were really helpful in giving me some big picture advice on where to go with the manuscript. So I'm excited for you to see the yeah, final I version when wait. it comes out next year. I guess I saw the opening, didn't I? Is that you what did. you saw the in class? Yeah, yeah. 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 So how do you think that book dialogues with Waiting for the Night Song? I mean, dialogues might be too, too no, highfalutin I, and literary a, a metaphor to use. But I like, well, how, you know, how, has, how has your work changed from Waiting for the Night Song to the new book? So I think there's a lot of similarities. It's also a book that engages climate science, and but at its at its heart, just like Waiting for the Night Song, I can say it's about climate change. I could say it's a mystery, but at its heart, it's a story about a friendship about of two women. Um, and the um, last beekeeper is a a story um, primarily about a, a father and daughter trying to repair a relationship. And it's set it's it's different in that it's set in the very very near future, not a remarkably different future. There's no like you know, spaceships running around or anything. It, it feels very much like now, but it's about an event um, that I'm not gonna tell you about, but an event that precipitates the collapse of the pollinators in a way that we did not anticipate. And so it sets the world into a, an agricultural and economic crisis um, instantly. It's not a, a slow cliff. Like we imagine the pollinators slowly drifting off right now. They just go right over the cliff. And so it has climate change themes and, but at its core, it is a story about relationships. It's set on the West Coast, right? If I remember correctly, or did I make that up? Well, actually, I'm interested. I'm inter I never, I don't name where it is in the book. I don't. Oh, and so, I, well, I think I it was the West Coast because we were in that beautiful we were, spot. We were in Oregon when we read Oregon. It. So yeah. that, yeah, that filtered through everything I read that. So I did not name the city. I refer to it as the city. Um, right. I don't name the year either because I feel mm -hmm. like for this story in particular, um, it's floating a little bit for the reader. And I think it's interesting that you assigned this place to it. And I yeah. think, you know, that I think when people read it, maybe they will assign what is what the city is and where it is, but right. I don't define where the city is. Well, it's floating. This never felt vague to me. You know, I, I, it wasn't a problem that it wasn't 
you know, listed or written as a specific point on the map. I, I felt that, you know, again, your descriptive vocabulary was so authoritative that, um, you know, it did all the work. Thank you. Yeah, now I'm excited to, I'll be, I'll be up late tonight, finish getting Good that luck. up. That is some exciting. Yeah, yeah, we're lucky to talk to you on this momentous night. Yeah, no, it is, it is very exciting. And I'm very, I'm happy with the way the book is going. So we'll cross Good. my finger, cross my fingers that the, my editor feels that way. Yeah. What's it like to be a most anticipated book? Um, and Katie said CNN, USA Today, Newsweek. Um, um, it was not expected. I feel very grateful. Um, I feel grateful to everybody who's read it. I mean, whether it's from my beta reader friends, my Tin House friends, some of them read copies of it. And, um, you know, I feel very grateful. And actually speaking of Tin House, even Katie, who introduced us was, yes. you know, is also a Tin House um, friend. She was in my writing group with Paul. And that's how we all three met each other together. And I've had a lot of people have had input in my book and you don't know until your book is out there if anybody's going to like it. You know, you hope, you hope, I, I tried to do, you know, to be fair to my characters and my story and hope then and, and the fact that some people are liking it is, it's what, it feels great. Um, it was unexpected, I guess. Yeah, that's great. Um, would you like to talk about some some books you're reading, some books you'd like to recommend? Yes, I would. I have a couple in mind I wanted to tell you about, actually. Speaking of, since we have like a Tin House theme, um, so that, that it was 20, was it 2019 we were there it was together? March 20, 2019, okay. early in the month. Yeah. Okay, so in March of 2019, we were at Tin House. There's a group of us out in Oregon. And so this book I'm going to share is this is called Wild Women in the Blues by Denny S. Bryce. And it's coming out in March. I'm lucky I got an early copy of it. And she was in our Tin House group. She was not in the workshop with Paul, but um, she was in our group. And this is a, also a dual timeline story about um, a, a jazz age and um, and the present right now and the stories speak to each other and it's beautiful. It's also been on a lot of great lists. Um, and also, I don't know how well you can see the cover is, it's hard to see with the glare. The cover is so amazing. It's got a lot of detail that's hard to see on Zoom, but I highly recommend um, Wild Women in the Blues by Denny S. Bryce. And another one person in our cohort, Elizabeth Gonzalez James also has a book um, called Mona at Sea, which um, I have not read yet because I've been so entrenched in this manuscript I'm finishing. So I'm dying to read it myself, but it's getting rave reviews and it's also been on a bunch of lists. And it's a, um, from what I've been reading about it in the reviews, it's like a kind of a dark coming of age story about a millennial who thinks she's got it all together in, in the great recession. And then it kind of falls apart because of the recession. And it's about her trying to grapple with, you know, who she is and she's adrift and it's, um, it sounds fantastic. So I'm really excited about my, you know, our Tin House fellows getting, books out into the world. And um, yeah, I highly recommend everybody look them up. Great. I think um, it's time to look at some questions. Okay. Let's see. Um, this, is, this one is from Phyllis who says, hi, Julie. You said you grew up in Maryland. I am a Maryland native as well. I was wondering where you spent your childhood. Curious about where your inspiration comes from. Oh, that's a great question. So I, I grew up um, outside of Annapolis. I had a lot of land around my house. Well, we weren't in the city. It was very, it was pretty rural, a lot of like horse farms and everything nearby. And so I played in the woods um, all the time. But the other part of Maryland that is a, um, it's a very Western Appalachian corner of Maryland, um, right out near West Virginia. Um, my family uh, came from that corner of Maryland and my grandparents had a farm there. And a lot of the imagery in this story came out of my brain from being in the woods in my grandparents' house in Maryland. Mm -hmm. Even though I'm telling a New Hampshire story and I'm making sure the trees and all the nature is, is accurate to New Hampshire, in my mind, the little girl running through the woods a lot of times is running through the woods at my grandparents' farm out in, um, in Garrett County in Maryland. Uh, and my grandparents' farm had a huge impact on me, I think, becoming a farmer, um, just spending time at my grandparents' place and, you know, planting potatoes with my grandfather. And he was a prolific flower gardener. He had this amazing flower garden. And um, yeah, so Maryland is definitely not named in my book, but there's definitely a little bit of Maryland in there. 
there's something about the description in your book that feels so cellular the way i mean it's it's taken in those images are taken in the way a child would perceive you know it's just it's that was me running through the woods, Paul. That wasn't Katie. <laughs> I put Katie's name on it, but that was all me. That little girl, my mother always says when, you know, when I talk to her about the book that she has a hard time separating me from Katie. And there's yeah. maybe a little bit of truth to that. <laughs> so here's a question from Jennifer. Do you have a favorite scene in the book without giving anything away for those of us who haven't read it? Well, I would say one of them is the scene I read you and that scene goes on more about the one about her jumping in the lake to get the um, the boat. And one of the reasons I like that scene so much is it does, you know, it's very entrenched in nature, but it's through the eyes of a little girl who just sees adventure everywhere. You know, she's, you know, sneaking through the kitchen and imagining trying to escape like Sherlock Holmes. And, you know, she goes out on the boat, she's imagining, a, you know, is there a murderer in there? Is there a lost child? Like everything in her mind is an adventure. And I think I saw the world like that when I was a kid. I, I used to write stories all the time and write, I used to write fan fiction scripts for um, Wonder Woman <laughs> TV shows and have my <laughs> friends act them out when I was a kid. But I think everything was an adventure and everything was exciting. And there's kind of this ex exuberance about breaking rules um, when you're a kid. And even if they aren't huge rules, but just the idea that she knew her parents didn't want her to jump in the lake, but she did it anyway to go in and to find this boat. And it, it's a pretty, you know, benign thing, but it, it was a, a rule breaking. And I think that there's a lot of that um, childhood exuberance, you know, to um, that I loved. And, and then there's some scenes um, in the adult storyline. There's a um, and I don't think this is giving anything away, where there's a fire. It's not in, in the town where they live, but it's a nearby fire. And Katie, as an adult, is a, a forestry worker um, trying to chase down this beetle that's causing forest fires. And she goes and meets with another a researcher and is walking through a forest after a fire. And um, so they're basically walking through you know, like a ghost forest um, of all these burnt trees, but yet still seeing life in the forest and looking mm -hmm. underneath the char and seeing that some of these trees are still alive and recognizing that the trees that survive a fire that manage to live are the more resilient of the trees. And as climate change continues, um, that's how the earth adapts in a lot of ways is, you know, if a fire comes or a devastating event um, or if waters are rising, the species that are the most resilient are the ones that will survive and then they will propagate. And so at a point, there's a point in that scene where um, not Katie, but the other woman says something like this is, you're seeing the future, the forest of the future, because these are the ones that lived and these are the ones that are going to repopulate the forest. So I liked that scene a lot because it yeah. felt, it felt like a, a turning point and a reflective moment in the book. Yeah. Do you want to read that scene? Is that obnoxious? Um, I don't know that I could find it on you. If, if I don't know exactly where it is, oh. to be honest with you, like I mean, but I'd have we'll, to do some yeah, like really boring yeah. page flipping. But let's go. We'll go ahead with. You have to buy the book. That's what it is. Everybody has to buy the book yeah, yeah. now to go find that scene. <laughs> uh, this is a, 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 a question from a different Jennifer. Hi, Julie. Matt and I are listening. We are so proud of you. Could you share some words of wisdom that I could pass along to my fourth graders about writing and the writing process? Wow. Um, yeah. So I, I would say write something that is on your heart, you know, in, in almost in any situation. I mean, I guess if you're writing a science paper, that's a little hard to, you know, to find to be to find a, the choices that you have. But if you're if you're writing creatively to find something that excites you and something that matters to you that you want to share with someone. Um, for me, with this story, I love the woods. Like I love being in nature and I love, um, you know, I love the, and this is going to sound kind of silly, but I love the, the taste of lake water when you dive into the, the lake. It, to me, it's like, this is that lake. Like I know it by like the taste of the water. And so that's something that I think that other people might not think about as much as I do. So I want to share that mm -hmm. because that's something from my brain I can offer to you. So maybe kind of, you know, if you, if you're looking for small moments, I guess that's what it is. Is to, to instead of writing about climate change, write about a, a bug, you know, one little bug and its impact and how, the, you know, to find small moments that you can, you know, share your passion with the world. That's, that's so beautifully said. 
I can't think of better, better advice, honestly. Usually like I was asked the other day as part of some event to give some advice and I just froze up and <laughs> infuriated with myself afterward because I, I couldn't, you know, pull genuine wisdom out of my head, but that's like so specific and so lovely. And I love the way you, you said it as a share. Thank you. Yeah. Here's a question from the wonderful Matt Gingrich, who is hey, in Matt. our workshop, and the wonderful writer. Um, did you struggle with the balance of past and present in the narrative? Did previous drafts reveal more or less of past? That's a great question. Yeah, I did struggle with that a lot, actually. I, if um, when I when I wrote my book, um, the two timelines are interwoven, and not every other chapter, but almost every, every, you know every couple chapters it switches timelines. And in the first couple of drafts, there wasn't a real logic to when I was changing time periods and what I was switching to. So I, I, I started thinking about it as needing a handoff between some, something to ground the reader when I switched times. And it could just be a theme, a feeling, it could be a person that was in the scene. It could be that they, you know, they were staring at trees and when I transition into the next one, they're, they're looking, something that, in, that makes the transition feel okay to the reader. Um, and that the information that I'm giving you from the past storyline needs to be in like relevant to the present storyline. So I couldn't just unzip the storylines and just, you know, stick them together in any, you know, any way they needed to make sense about why something that Katie did when she was 11 needs to be paired up with this chapter that happened when she was 39. It's like the past and the present are talking to each other and they're telling one story and it's the reader's job to take the pieces of information from both stories and put them together to be one story, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. That's that's also beautifully answered. I mean, and it I, didn't, you know, I didn't come to it naturally though. There was a lot of work that went into that. <laughs> yeah, I think of what you're talking about is a conversation with images, like that yeah. is the thing, that associativeness is what holds the thinking of such a book together. Um, we need, we could use another, oh, oh, we're getting, we're getting more cute questions. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Um, this is one from Devin or Devon. Um, can you um, share your writing practices? And especially when you know a draft is done. Uh, can you repeat that? I didn't quite understand. Oh yeah, that. sure. Um, can you share your writing oh, practices? Oh, share my writing practices. And especially when you know a draft is done. Yeah, yeah. So. I'm horrible. My writing practices are not something anybody wants to emulate. I have no, no, I know that there's those writers who say, yes, I get up at 5 a.m. every day and I write for four hours. I have no, I have no organizational plan. Um, I write when I can write. Um, and some, there are some times, some time periods when I'm really into my story um, that I could write for 12 hours every day and just, and I would be, just keep going and I'd be energized. And there's sometimes when I have a very hard time getting in that brain space to do it. Um, I've had to force myself into that having, especially the first book, having four young kids and working on the farm and things that I had to take what moments I could, which is why it took me so long because I'm not always the kind of writer that if you hand me four hours of time, I can use those four hours of time productively. I, um, I need for what, whatever it is that, I don't know, I don't call it magic, but I need some, I need my brain to be in the right place to be able to write. And that was a problem for me during the pandemic because I had a lot of time in front of me and I had a very hard time writing during a good, good bit of the pandemic um, because I just, I couldn't make myself do it. It wasn't a lack of will. I, I just wasn't being productive. Um, so. I wish I had some great advice to share about that, but I think, you know, other, I know other writers who have these brilliant strategies that I, I've never been able to um, absorb, unfortunately. And as far as when a draft is done, I don't know that anybody ever thinks their book is really finished, but for me, when I sent it, when it was when I wanted to send it out to query uh, literary agents, I felt like I had told a complete story. And I think that's what it was. It's like, I felt like in my mind, I hadn't left any big questions unanswered. Um, so, you know, obviously some of the parts needed to be worked on and changed and revised, but I felt like I had a complete story with an arc and, you know, beginning, a middle and end. And that, I guess that would be my best answer. That's great. Let's see, there's um, 
One from um, Moni. Um, can you share a little bit uh, about the editing process with the publisher? How different was it for you before the book sold? Hey, Monet. Monet was with us. Oh, Monet. At, um, I'm so sorry, she, Monet. She was with us at Tin House, too. She oh. was not in our workshop, but she was in one of the other ones. Um, I'm waving, Monet. <laughs> we're both waving. Um, I see I see a couple of our, our Tin House folks in the chat. Um, so when I sent the book to my editor, um, I had done several revisions with my agent before it got to the editor. And my, my editor had really insightful visions for how my book could change. And uh, I'll give you one example. Um, so there is a thing that happens that I can't tell you. Um, it's toward the end of the book. Um, and I wrote, I, she, I wrote that scene eight times and it was dramatically different eight times. It wasn't just a little tweak. It was eight whole different takes on what happens to a certain individual in my book. And um, you know, she would send it back to me and say, mm, not quite right. And she would never be prescriptive in telling me what to do, but she could guide me by what the emotional response she wanted. You know, like I want it to feel like this or it needs to accomplish this goal, but she never said, you know, you need to get in a car and drive and do that. You know, she didn't tell me what to do, but she told me what she wanted out of it. And I like that because I feel like she had, she knew what I wanted out of the book, um, you know, what the, um, you know, what I wanted to leave readers with and what my intent was. And she was really great about finding the problems in the plot or the character or the relationships, identifying the problems and guiding me towards um, fixing them in a way that elevated the vision I already had. Like she never tried to change what I was doing with my book. She just helped me make the small parts better. Mm -hmm. So I feel very lucky about that. I feel like I've had um, like a pretty spectacular editor to work with. Excellent. Um, we have, I think, one time for one more. Hi, Julie. This is from, again, I might get this name wrong, Toyin. Oh, um, Toyin, yes. No, good. Hi, Julie. Congratulations again. You're obviously very outdoorsy and in <laughs> tune with nature. If you had to choose, uh, this is a great way to end. If you had to choose, what would you choose as your spirit animal? Oh my God, I love this question. It is such a bear. It is a bear, bear, bear is my spirit animal. <laughs> There's a scene in the book um, that involves a bear um, towards the end of the book. And it was a big deal for me to have that scene in the book because I had a scene with a bear that I loved desperately. Like I thought it was brilliant. I thought this was the best scene that had ever been written. I love this scene. And when I was workshopping in the incubator, everybody told me to cut the scene. Oh, and no. I was, I was Devast I no. cried. I mean, I, I, I sobbed when I cut the scene out, but it was, it, I didn't belong in the book. And then in the revision process, towards the end, my character's driving down the road and the bear showed up on the side of the road and came back into the book. And so that is the, a great question. And I have a very solid answer. My the spirit <laughs> animal is, is a bear. <laughs> great. Thank you so much, Julie. And thank you um, so much. Um, to Greenlight for hosting tonight. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, please buy Julie's book from Greenlight. Greenlight's a wonderful store. And um, yeah, thanks. I think Katie is going to come on. Yes, and hello. And thank you, Paul. Final thank you for nights. being here. Yeah, I really enjoyed seeing both of you. It's a little mini reunion for the yeah. three of us. I know. Thank you both so much for that great discussion and to everybody for being here. It's uh, as Julie mentioned, I, you know, was in her group with Paul. And so it's been such a delight to see this book come out into the world and to be able to host this event. I'm really thrilled that we could do this tonight. It was so great to hear you both in discussion and see so many of our Tin House friends in the audience and see everybody. Um, so <laughs> hey, thank Tin you House. All for joining us. And also, if you miss any of tonight's event, if you just want to watch it again, we will be posting it on our YouTube. So please make sure to look out for it there. And definitely don't forget to buy your copy of Waiting for the Night Song in store or online at greenlightbookstore.com. So thank you both so much. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, everybody, for coming. I really appreciate it.